subscribe with notifications on. One thing, I really don't understand what the purpose of it is. And not a lot of people know it, but if you Haitian, you know what I'm about to say. Right. What's the purpose of Shum Shum? So listen, What's the point of Shum Shum? Listen, You're eating my, dirt. It's dust. Oh, listen oh, to me. Oh. So we are having a podcast with ACLN. This is brand new. Guys, so excited to share what we have for you guys today. So my name is Nanai. I am from Salisbury, Maryland. A, represent the Eastern Shore, okay? And I am a mom and a wife. I have two beautiful children. My husband, and um, his name is Jacques. And I'm currently an entrepreneur. So I do real estate. We do flips. We do rentals. So if you need houses, come see me, okay? Um, and today we have a wonderful special special guest for you guys. I'm so excited. And guys, hey, we about to laugh. We gonna cry maybe. And we just gonna get down. Okay? So guys, take off your shoes. Take off your wig if you need to. Take off the lashes. And let's get let's get down, down, down and dirty. Alright? So today we have the wonderful pastor, Jeriel Puydan. So if you can introduce yourself, tell the people who you are if they don't know you. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I am super excited to be here. This is my first year attending um, this retreat. And of course, I'm, I'm honored to be one of the first interviews for this podcast. Legit, it's all God. My name is Jerry L. Prudent. Um, I'm, you know, uh, endearingly known as Pastor Gigi. Um, I am from Miami, Florida. I am the first born of Reverend Bishops Wilner and Naomi Prudent I'm from Pentecostal Church of Miami or L'Église de Dieu de Siloye. Um, my parents are well known in the Haitian community and I say this all of the time. I'm honored to have been birthed out of them. Um, I am an educator. I have my master's degree in um, early childhood education and educational leadership. Um, I enjoy beauty so I'm a beauty specialist. I'm a licensed esthetician and nail tech. I'm also a worship leader, gospel recording artist. My album is called Jesus Saves. Um, so check it out when you get the chance. It's a bilingual worship album. Um, my prayer is that you will absolutely enjoy it. Play it during your prayer time. Um, and that's just who I am. I love God. I love people. And I'm ready to share my testimony with y'all today. Yes, yes, yes. You do a lot. Oof. Listen, when I grow up, I want to be just like you, okay? Yeah, you're doing it, though. I'm trying to be like you while you're flipping houses. All right? So were you born in the States or in Haiti? No, I I was born in Queens, New York. Oh, okay. Do you see that I carry myself as such? <laughs> um, so do you got a little bit of New York accent? Well, to be honest with you, I was only there for three months of my life. Okay. And my parents moved um, to Miami, Florida, because my father was like, Florida is where I want to be. Um, he was not feeling the city life in New York, um, but a lot of his, um, a lot of his grounding for him to kind of really get himself situated when he came to the states came from the support and the push that he got when when he was in New York. My father, my mother was in New York first. Um, after five years or so, she brought my dad in. They used to attend um, Pastor Honoré Jacques Church oh, in Cortez. Road. Ah. And so my parents absolutely love his ministry. And there are many people, all the Haitians in New York, know Pastor Onere oh, yeah. Jacques. I mean, oh, yeah. he was a pillar mm -hmm. in the Haitian, you know, ministry, especially in Church of God. It was an incredible, it was an incredible um, transition that they had. They moved to Florida and God had spoken to dad and told him, listen, you're going to start a church ministry out there. So, I mean, I, like I said, I was only born in New York for three I was born in New York lived there for three months of my little old life mm -hmm. and they moved us down to Florida and I've been I've been raised in Florida ever since you don't miss it up here I love up here to visit. <laughs> okay? Let's the to visit. visit. Right. <laughs> to visit. You know? I love the changing seasons. Yes. But as soon as the leaves start falling to the ground, your girl is out of here. You could have the snow and all the snowstorms and the, all the y'all can have that. I can handle the hurricane. But I ain't, I ain't dealing with the snow. Come on now. No. Make snow angels go out. Like, no, come on. That's fun. No. That's, you know? No, ma'am. 
Okay. You go to the beach, mm -hmm. you dip in the water, you come out, you could get dried off, and that's it. It's summer all it's summer all year long. That's the life. Right. But you can come for the winter too. Come on now. The snow is fun too. You don't have to stay in it, but you can like, you know, have some fun in it. Especially if you have kids, they're gonna love the snow. Yes, to visit. So I know your parents are really well known in the Haitian community, right? So growing up in in the Haitian community with your parents, did you feel like you had to follow their footsteps? Was there pressure to like, yo, I gotta be a minister? I gotta be in ministry like my parents How, what was that like for you growing, growing up? up was there pressure <laughs> is that a question right right right, right. there is pressure mm -hmm. it's not a past tense mm -hmm. there is pressure mm -hmm. um but the pressure was never really from my parents mm -hmm. i i my my dynamics with my family um, our parents raised us to love ministry. Mm -hmm. I never resented ministry. Um, I mean, I would sit in my car and my parents would play song tracks and we would sing it together. And then whenever he would go to revivals to preach, he would have me as his sermonic um, musical selection. Mm -hmm. And before his sermon, anywhere he went to preach, I would sing before he preached. Mm -hmm. And at a young age, I didn't really, I couldn't articulate that I felt the presence of God and I knew this was a calling. Mm -hmm. But every time I stood up there to sing before my dad, I was so proud, mm -hmm. you know, to sing for daddy before he preached. Mm -hmm. So it was something that I learned to love before it really became came a ministry to me it was just it flew out it flowed out of me because that's the dynamic that created in the home yeah. um, we played church at home mm -hmm. so when we got to the church building it didn't feel like work it was this continuation it was a continuation mm -hmm. the pressure came from the people right I was constantly compared to my parents. I was constantly put in this place where I had to live up to something, but my parents never made me feel that way. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, after, after a while, I began to feel like people did that to me to cause me to feel that resentment so that they could say things like, oh, pastor toujours met petit pastor yo sou moun, gen lot moun ki gen don, gen lot moun ki gen cap, you know, capacité and stuff like that. And so they tried to do that to make me resent it. And then for them to say, petit ou pas même vle position when you over here elevating your child, there's other people here who can do it. Yeah. And so it was that, that was the struggle that I faced in the church. Mm -hmm. um, um, and it was really sad because our um, the experience I've had, they didn't understand the beauty of continuity, mm -hmm. the beauty of passing on a legacy and honoring that, mm -hmm. you know. I'm not saying that every pastor's... Um, every pastor's kid should be a pastor. That's not what I'm saying. Everyone has a different grace and a different call, right? right. right? Um, but what I'm saying is the pressure of the congregation, mm -hmm. the expectations, mm -hmm. um, you can't mess up. Mm -hmm. You can't trip up. Mm -hmm. You can't have a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. You can't not get a degree. You can't say, I don't want to do this today. Mm -hmm. Those pressures were so heavy. And after a while, um, because people would say so much, there was a, there was a, there was a time in my life in leadership I was serving. Um, I was serving as event coordinator in ministry, um, and I'm I'm going to be real transparent with y'all right now. You know, I was serving as event coordinator in ministry in, in, for for the youth, mm -hmm. and it was one of the most difficult times I've ever had to serve in ministry because the person who was my leader at the time. Mm -hmm. um, was 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 really trying to prove themselves through works and to prove that they're better at what they did mm -hmm. than the own pastor's daughter. Oh, it became like a competition. So it became a competition. Mm -hmm. And so I was constantly fighting, you know, to prove that I was able to do what I could do. Mm -hmm. 
and I, it, it thankfully my, my, my parents and my family understood that dynamic and as as long as I can remember my father was always the one to push us forward he was always the one to say you you're gifted you're talented you're anointed there's so much that you can do you know um, and I was never identified you know, as less than. Mm -hmm. um, my parents always considered me Jeriel mm -hmm. And when we were in church, they made sure everyone addressed me as Pastor Jeriel Yeah. Yeah. But it was a challenge for people because I was the same age as them. You know, it, it was a it was a it was a struggle. But I never experienced that from my family. Mm -hmm. um, and I still today I have a love and a passion for ministry. And it always um, it always surprises me to hear other people's testimony of what I've done that's impacted them mm -hmm. or inspired them mm -hmm. or encouraged them. Mm -hmm. Because I'm constantly like, Lord, am I am I doing enough? Are people relating? Is what I'm saying making sense? Mm -hmm. You know, is is my life really making a difference? Mm -hmm. You know? And so, you know, that's the space that I'm in. But and I think that's the true heart of a minister. Yeah. They're always trying to make sure that they're doing Doing their absolute best, but always, you know, wondering there, there's more mm -hmm. that can be done. And I'm, I'm so honored that your parents like was like that with you because I think a lot of times being preachers, they put a lot more pressure on their kids, and the kids feel like they have to meet up to that expectation. Mm -hmm. So the fact that your parents were the one lifting you up, encouraging you to find your purpose, mm -hmm. not necessarily follow their purpose, yeah. what they, what they wanted. So it's like a lot of other young kids with parents and ministry they really struggle you know yeah. and the pressure comes from home and from outside yeah so the fact that you at least had a place of peace i had a strong support yeah. system yeah and i was able to be me at home mm -hmm. and when i was at church i was pastor gigi mm -hmm. but at home i was gigi mm -hmm. i was the daughter mm -hmm. there was a they, they they did their best to create that separation awesome. and that dynamic really and awesome. it's very important yeah you know so when did you like figure that out that you know what this is my calling this is my purpose this is what I'm meant to do how when did that happen how did that happen because I know you said that you know you were um, singing for your father every time before he went to preach so when did that go from like you love doing this to like this is definitely what the Lord is calling me to do well I when I was um, younger I always had prophetic dreams mm -hmm. so since I was a, at a very young age as young as like 10 11, 12, mm -hmm. I always had dreams of my older self ministering to thousands of people, mm -hmm. ministering at different places, different, you know, um, geographical locations. I've always had those kinds of dreams. So at a young age, I understood that I was called to something greater, mm -hmm. you know, but when I truly felt like I embraced it, interestingly enough, was here in Philly. Wow. Um, I received an invitation to preach a youth a, a youth revival um, this was back in like 2010 or so mm -hmm. and it was it was um, the Libla family that invited me mm -hmm. to come and preach this youth revival and I wasn't even ordained or anything yet it was just by association from coming here you know my dad used to come here back to back every year mm -hmm. for the Haitian um, crusade here and it was always extraordinary that that was an experience we loved coming out here for the crusade mm -hmm. we were dead by we was like we traveled with pastor we came out here we danced we did a whole mass choir so we mixed our youth with the youth here in philly it was an experience we loved it and so the at the time the youth out here were like yo we need we, we want to get Gigi out here and i was shook because i had never preached a revival before I did my little 15 minutes that was required in seminary at my church. But that was it. In youth ministry, mm -hmm. you know, like that's youth ministry is kids ministry. Like you're dealing with 15, 16, 17. But I, they asked me to come and preach a whole youth revival. Mm -hmm. And and so my dad was like, you're ready. You can do this. And my mom came with me. My younger sister came with me. And that was the first time I flowed mm -hmm. in my gift to such a magnitude that I was, it scared me. Mm. 
because I was like, there's all this in me? Mm -hmm. I was like, yo, it was an incredible experience. And that experience was the highlight. And also, it was the propelling, in a sense. It was the ministry, that was that ministry engagement propelled me. Yeah. And ever since then, it was just... It was going up from there, and I'm, yeah. I'm grateful for it. Yeah, and I know you are you mentor um, female pastors and ministers, yes. correct? Yes. So, what advice would you give to women pastors that are out, out there that are struggling to figure out? where I guess they fit, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I know like what challenges also that you have as a female pastor? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So my mentorship program is called Manifestology. Mm. Um, and it's based off of Second Kings um, 3, 3 and 4, where um, the prophet Elijah showed up um, and there was a woman, a widow woman with her two sons. Mm -hmm. And she says to him, the tax, the tax collectors are coming to collect my son because my husband, a prophet that you know, um, has passed away and we have all this debt that we have to pay back. And so the tax collectors are like, yo, if you can't pay this debt, um, we're going to take your two sons. And I feel like there are a lot of women in ministry right now who are stuck in this space where they felt like they've always had to depend on a male counterpart mm -hmm. in order for them to push forward. Mm -hmm. And... I've, I've been meditating on that word for like the last three years, and that's what birthed manifestology. Um, through through that chapter, the Lord gave me 10 different points, and I'm not going to share it all. That You know, I'm going to just give you this much for the free 99, glory to God. <laughs> um, <laughs> Amen. But um, the, the the whole premise of manifestology is to be able to push women in ministry and marketplace for them to know that there's a converging of the both of both, and that they don't need to depend on a male. Not that we don't need him, but they don't have to depend on that male image for them to be able to push and to do what it is that they have to do and to prosper in it. Little did the woman know that she had everything that she needed for her to be able to come out of the situation that was she was in, and the prophet gave her instruction. She followed through with the instruction, and it was because of her following through with the instruction he gave her, she became a marketplace entrepreneur, and not only did she become that, but she she learned how to, how to cultivate what she had in a quiet place. He told her to go behind closed doors, shut the doors with you and your sons, pour out this oil. Many of us don't realize that sometimes it's not that you're depressed, it's not that you're broken, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not negating that you're experiencing those things, but sometimes it's in those quiet places. Yeah. God is trying to call us to an intimate place where he can pour into us and we pour out what's in us. And what we've poured out, we can monetize. Yeah. What we've poured out, we can maximize. And so she got to a place because of the instruction of the prophet that she learned how to monetize her story. Mm -hmm. She monetized her struggle. Mm -hmm. And she was able to, sh to provide something that the community didn't have. Mm -hmm. She was able to, to apply a principle where she used the community Community to give her what she needed, poured into it, and sold the community back their own resources. Yeah. Do you see what I just said? Yeah. There was an exchange that happened. My, I believe my goal right now in this season is to show other women who love God, but also want to tap into marketplace that they can do it. Yeah. There's oil in their house and their little bit of oil is not too little for God to use to feed an entire community. You have enough in you to nourish a community of people. The people that I reach, you could pro you probably can't reach Nene. Mm -hmm. And the people you reach, I can't reach Nene. But the both of us own this podcast right now are speaking to two different groups of people right. that we can attract. Imagine me, I've got my group, you've got your group, right. but together we've got all these people. Yeah. And this organization is doing an incredible job because we, we're reaching out to a group of people that we probably could never reach out to individually. Right. So she was able to speak to a community of people to give her jars. Mm -hmm. She put into those jars mm -hmm. and she served what she had back to them. And because she found a, a problem to solve, she became a marketplace entrepreneur um, solving a problem. Mm -hmm. We as women, there are problems that we can solve. Oh, yeah. We are far greater than we give mm -hmm. ourselves credit for. Mm -hmm. And, and it, you can tell I'm passionate about this because oh, yeah. I want other young women like myself to know that they can make an impact and they don't need they don't need that that you know, for them to depend on, which is a male, but he they can partner with him mm -hmm. to push a vision.
vision, mm -hmm. but it's not a need for them to feel like that's what's going to bring them value. Yeah. You know, the the male will acknowledge the value you already know you have. Yeah. I said something there. Is there is there any married people watching? He'll acknowledge that value because he says you're his. The scripture says you're the favor. Mm -hmm. So I have to believe that I am the favor. I carry that favor, mm -hmm. and that's what I want other women to know. You carry that favor. So how did you get to that place? Because it's challenging to get there, right? Girl. Because as, to, as a fem as a female, we gonna get a lot of hey, you you can't do this by yourself. You need somebody else. Like you. So how did you get over those challenges and obstacles to thrive in your lane as a female pastor? Well, I struggled with low self esteem all the way up until um, high school. Mm -hmm. I was always the big the biggest girl in my class. Um, in my class. So I was always picked on. Um, I was always misunderstood. So I had to really fight for myself. I'm from the 305, if you know what I'm saying. So your girl know how to put up a set. You hear me? So I had to, but I had to learn that because I was always bullied because I was the big girl in the class. Um, and because of that, I always had this desire to want to be accepted in a sense. And when I got out of high school, I got into a relationship with a young man mm -hmm. and he completely took advantage of me mm -hmm. because of my lack of self-esteem. Yeah, yeah. So I was taken advantage of and it was coming out of that situation um, that I realized there's more about me than I ever gave my, myself credit for. Mm -hmm. My mother and my father, my father when I was in that situation, I, I will never forget, my father took the time every single morning. He said, I'm sorry. Wow. He said, I'm sorry that I wasn't there enough for you to know that you were valuable mm -hmm. for you to end up in a situation like that. Yeah. And he took his time for like three months that summer, every morning at 6 a.m. It was our time, our daddy-daughter time, for like an hour or two in the garage at my house. Mm -hmm. And he would love on me, pray for me. We would do Bible study together. He would say, let me help you plan out your life. What do you want to do? Who do you want to become? Wow. Um, and that was the game changer for me. Mm -hmm. And after I came out of that situation, um, at the end of those three months, they did a whole ceremony one Sunday morning, put me on the stage, and they pushed the shit away. And they said, Jeliel is part of us. So you disrespect her, you disrespect us. Mm -hmm. You respect her, you respect us. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to rededicate her back to God. Wow. And we're not going to do service as usual this Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. We're going to have you all travail with us because we need our daughter to know that she's loved, mm -hmm. she's chosen, and she's called for more. Whatever happened yesterday is erased. Mm -hmm. They laid me out on the, on the altar, wrapped me up in a, in a white sheet, my mom and dad laid on me. The church travailed. Wow. I don't think I've ever remembered a roar in the sanctuary as heavy as the war I heard that Sunday. They pushed me through. Mm -hmm. And it's because of my parents' prayers. It's because of the support of so many people. Mm -hmm. And it's because I've come to a place in my relationship with God where I know that my value is attached, is directly parallel to my relationship with him. Mm -hmm. That's why I am mm -hmm. who I am here today. Yeah. Because of that. Yeah. And crazy, yeah. I went through a similar situation. So when I was about 16, I got into a relationship um, that I shouldn't have been in. Right. And it, before I knew it, it, it was out of my control. Right. And it became where I was like severely abused. Yeah. And where it became like physical abuse. Yeah. I couldn't get out because he had isolated everyone from my life. Oh my gosh. So you had your father, and I did at a time, but because he had pushed him away and made me think like I wasn't worthy. Oh, I wasn't that's good it. enough. Yeah. That's it right there. And 
like now you got me getting emotional too oh. and it's like you know that's not who you are right but it's like they say it so much you think yeah that's who you are and like so many females struggle with that yeah and even though that happened i feel like that helped me so much Absolutely. to become this woman even though this happened like i was 19 i'm 31 now yeah but i'm so grateful that happened it's weird to say though it right is, right but i'm so grateful because it, it propelled me to have a better understanding of my relationship with god yeah and also the world and also how things can be construed in like a really weird place because I didn't really struggle with identity or anything like that. I always knew who I was, who I wanted to be. But it was just like, I, I was like, how did I let myself end up in that relationship? Exactly. I was exactly. like, how, how, how did you not know who you are? Exactly. How did you end up with this guy and right. letting this man put his, put his hands on you? Right. Let him talk down on you? Right. So it was just like, I'm just super always so grateful when I get to meet women like you who speak, who are able to speak about their experiences because I know there are females out there right. that are probably in that same situation and they just don't know how do I get out? Right. How, what, what does the other side look like? And I just, if you can just speak to those females out there so that they can have the push to get out and stay out yes. because we, we sometimes get out and go back because it's like, I don't know what to do because now this person was my everything. I was dependent upon then. And now I'm by myself. How, how do I function without this person that I was attached to that I thought I needed mm -hmm. in order to function. You know, that emotional attachment, uh, that emotional attachment is so real, mm -hmm. but you know, to take on the assignment, you know, your request, there's beauty in brokenness. Mm -hmm. um, I just really want to say that your brokenness um, is what makes you so unique. The experiences you've had makes you unique. Yeah, it does. Um, it doesn't define you in a negative way, right. but it gives you something that you could look back on to say, I've been through this and I can come out of it. Yes. Um, and I came out bigger, better, and stronger. Um, and you don't have to stay in that space. Mm -hmm. I was that person. I left and I came back into the, I, I, it was a cycle. I left the relationship, came back into it, left it and came back into it until I came to the place where I said, all right, Gigi, who are you? Mm -hmm. Who are you in God? Mm -hmm. I had to question myself. Yeah. You've got to sit yourself down and ask yourself, who are you? No, for real. And answer the question. Mm -hmm. And it, it's going to take some time. Too. It's going to take some time yeah. for you to, to put it into words. Mm -hmm. But you got to sit there and answer that question mm -hmm. and trust that God will see you yeah. through. Yes. If he did it for Rahab. He can do it for you. Yes. Rahab wasn't even a daughter of Israel. She heard of the victories that Israel obtained. Mm -hmm. She was a whole professional, mm -hmm. sacred prostitute. Mm -hmm. But because she aligned her mind to the, 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 the victories and the precepts of Israel at the time, she hid the spies. Mm -hmm. They honored her. And because of her, of what she did, the sacrifice she did, God granted permission for them to save Rahab when, yeah. when Jericho came down. And she ended up being the great, 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 great mother, great, great grandmother of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So there is beauty in your story, but you have to, you have to make a decision up here first yeah. to say, I am not those things. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline Carr said in her song, when the devil says, I am something, I say, I'm not that. Mm -hmm. When he says, I'm not something, I say, I am that. You've got to speak the opposite of what the enemy's saying yeah. and contradict it with the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, gosh, I mean, I am so grateful to like have this conversation with you because I feel like it's the process of getting to a place of just knowing yourself is really hard. It is. It is. It's so hard. It's, but, but it's a beautiful yeah. journey of discovery. Yeah. And you you never really know who you are. Mm -hmm. You're rediscovering yourself in different spaces of your life. Mm -hmm. When you were younger, you knew yourself as that. Right. When you transition into adulthood, you begin to learn new things about yourself. Mm -hmm. As you transition from singlehood to, you know, to courtship 
courtship, you learn different things about yourself. Mm -hmm. And women who have become married, they they can feel that emotional, psychological, and physical transition from singleness into marriage life. They can feel the change is different. When when you become pregnant, you have a child. Mm -hmm. There's a change. You, it's a physical change on the on the, from the molecular level to the psychological level. Mm -hmm. You feel those changes. So you're constantly changing, constantly re rediscovering who it is that you are. Yeah. So really, don't be afraid of those changes, but embrace them because you begin to see how flexible you are. Mm -hmm. You begin to see how beautiful mm -hmm. those changes are. Mm -hmm. And and we're like we're like the trees, right? With the changing seasons, mm. it goes through seasons as well. Yeah. And every season is beautiful. Yeah. Say that again. Can you say that again? Every season <laughs> yes. is beautiful. Mm -hmm. From the season where you're fully blossoming with leaves and flowers blooming to the seasons where you look dry mm -hmm. and brittle. Right. But little do you know that in those dry and bitter seasons, you're really just conserving your energy mm -hmm. for when springtime comes. Because, baby, when springtime comes, that's your time to spring forth. Okay. So now that we are, you, you have so many things that you do. Mm -hmm. And I know you are a mentor. You are a... Um, a teacher, you are a pastor, you are an artist. And um, how does all that like tie into like your calling, your purpose? Because I know sometimes um, we feel like we have to choose one or the other. Like we either in like full-time ministry but can't do anything else or if you're in something else, how does, how does all the things you do tie in to your calling, your purpose? Well, it's two things I would say. Purpose found me, and it was my responsibility mm -hmm. to act on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the things that I'm doing now found me. Mm -hmm. People would ask things of me, and I would serve them in that capacity. And in doing it, I realized there's there's something that's naturally flowing out of me from this. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, from receiving prophetic words and confirmations and acting on certain things, then I began to realize, okay, well, if this is the direction that God is telling me mm -hmm. he wants to go for my life, then there are certain decisions I have to make. Mm -hmm. So I went to school, and I got those degrees, and I studied, and I've read, and I've done what I needed to do practically mm -hmm. to be able to effectively hold or maintain what it is he says that he's confided in me. Mm -hmm. So purpose found me mm -hmm. and I did what was necessary for me to act on purpose. I got you. So I know you're Haitian oui. and you know we love our Haitian food. Uh -huh. So listen, I don't want you to get kicked out of the Haitian club. So tell me that. <laughs> My Haitian card runs deep. Okay. It can't run deeper than mine. It can't run deeper than mine. Right. I can't compare to you, but you know, we somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So it's like when you cut my veins open, you see blue and red. Blue and red. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, what is one Haitian meal or dish or item that you hate that's going to make all the Haitians just kick you out right now? <laughs> okay. I... I bless God because I, I love all food. I'm a foodie. Mm -hmm. I will eat any and everything. Mm -hmm. But there's this one thing. <laughs> I really don't understand what the purpose of it is. And not a lot of people know it, but if you Haitian, you know what I'm about to right. say. Right. You got to be Haitian Haitian to know. What's the purpose of shum shum? What? Shum shum is delicious. The, what is shum shum? Tell me right now. So what's listen, the point of shum shum? Listen, You're eating what? dirt. It's dust. Oh, listen oh, to me. Oh, shum shum is dust. Back. Guys, on pardon it, because he's back on the field. No, oh, no. He's back. Oh, shum shum, guys. It's the best thing no, ever. No, it's not. It is. They Big grind up. Not. They grind up some peanuts that's roasted. They put cinnamon, nutmeg, and guys, you can eat it in like nice little scoops. And, and it's just like, she said, and it's she said it's grounded. I mean, like, the, it's dry. Y'all know the cinnamon powder challenge they did on TikTok? <laughs> not even close. A 
of cinnamon and everybody had to eat a spoonful of it. That's what shum shum is. Yes. <laughs> you put a spoon in your mouth and you <laughs> coughing everywhere. Oh, like, There's no point for shum shum. Now, now, we will forgive you because no babies will forgive us. So it's, 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 it's real. It's disgusting. Oh man, Pass, this has been so wonderful talking to you. I definitely Thank wish we can do this again because we had too much good. We had too much. We had a really, really good time. So, guys, I hope you guys tune in. Come back. We have more in store, right? Again, thank you, thank you, thank you for your time, your you. your dedication to serving the people, the Haitians, and continue to do awesome work. We love thank you. you. Appreciate you. Oh, I love y'all and I appreciate you. And we thank love you, you guys. Yeah. And thanks for watching. Bye, guys.